the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. One of the most amazing and powerful stories of this past year was that of Brant Jean. Brant's brother, Botham Jean, was killed by an off-duty officer still in uniform who mistakenly entered what she thought was her own apartment, but was actually one floor below her apartment. And as she entered, she saw the door ajar and suspected an intruder. She shot and killed this suspected intruder, who happened to be the actual resident of the apartment and also happened to be a black man. And the police officer was a white woman. A tragic situation was exacerbated by the larger national narrative around race and our justice system, and it was further intensified by the revealing of racist or racially insensitive texts that she had sent and it would have been very easy for Botham's brother, Brant, to vilify the police officer, Amber Geiger, to place all of these missteps of injustice, all of this history on her shoulders, to have his anger only intensify following the sentencing that was a little over a third of what the judge had recommended. What would he have wanted from God at that moment? Would God's redemption of this moment look more like Isaiah's warning of God's coming with vengeance and terrible recompense? Or would it have been to have his heart cleansed, to not just seek vengeance or even justice, but to see this moment within that beautiful vision that we read last week from Isaiah where the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. Instead of seeing this person within that larger narrative as an issue, but seeing her as a person, a broken person, allowed him to open up his heart in a different way, a more graceful way. Well, when he took the stand to make a victim impact statement, there was a lot on the line because it wasn't just about two individuals. People were upset with the sentencing. They'd been upset earlier in the trial. The case had already drawn protests in the Dallas area and was being watched on a national scale. And with a quivering voice, with tears, and what genuinely seemed like a visceral response, like a spontaneous expression of both faith and fellow humanity, he forgave her. He didn't just forgive her with the inability to forget, to clean his own soul. He did more than that. He didn't stop there. He pronounced that he loved her, that he loved her a fellow child of God. He loved her. And because he loved her, he did not want to see her suffer. He didn't even want to see her go to prison. He didn't want an eye for an eye. He prayed that she would seek God's forgiveness and lead a good, rich life to be happy. He then asked the judge for permission to hug the woman who killed his brother. It was an incredibly awkward moment. Even watching the video made me squirm a bit, and the judge didn't know what to do. Certainly, the defendant didn't know what to do. She squirmed in her own seat. In that moment, nobody seemed to know what to do because there wasn't much of a precedent for it. And after an uncomfortable silence, the judge said, okay. And before Brandt could make his way to the defendant's table, she met him, the defendant, Amber, met him in the middle of the courtroom, and they hugged. And it wasn't 
a short hug. It wasn't an insincere hug. It seemed like a hug where she put everything that was on her into him, and she, he received it, and the forgiveness was somehow sacramentized or sealed in this long embrace. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And the little child shall lead them. I think what struck me so powerfully about the young man's words and actions is one, how desperately, how desperately the world needs voices that truly seek reconciliation and that are willing to rend their hearts towards difficult, difficult love. And two, how much I am not as confident in my own heart to do the same. I want God's justice. I want God's vision and God's politics and God's theology and God's heart to look like mine, even though I know how much I depend desperately on God's mercy and God's love being so much more than that. On some level, I just want to be right. And I want God to show the people who are not the heir of their ways. I'm not proud of that, far from it, nor do I want to stay there. But if I'm honest, that's where I often am, wanting God to affirm my rightness. At least I have some good company, since I'm sure none of you have ever felt that way. Uh, at least I have John. And this morning we find John in prison. John is imprisoned for his relentless pursuit of what he sees as right. And in this case, it's challenging the validity of King Herod's marriage to his brother's wife, Herodias. Now in those days, prisons did not supply the prisoners' basic needs, so visitors would, uh, would be a regular occurrence. They'd be uh, a necessity. They would bring food, a change of clothes, water, uh, and so, John probably got a daily update, if not several times a day, on what was going on with this Jesus thing. You can imagine that he received regular updates and he's probably asking, okay, so how is the winnowing going? Who's on the threshing room floor today? Who's getting knocked down a bit? And he heard stories that seemed very much to the contrary. Jesus, I mean John, who was called to herald Jesus' coming, wasn't too impressed. This wasn't the way it was supposed to happen. And imagine putting on John's uh, uh, role for a second. He, in his whole life, his whole life has been about heralding this Savior, this Messiah who is to come, this Emmanuel God with us. And he's probably spent his entire life envisioning what it would look like. This person would conquer Rome. This person uh, would bring down all of those haughty religious leaders that are profiting at other people's expense. This person would make justice reign and it would tremble so much that the temple would shake, that Rome would be shaking in their footsteps, that there'd be no doubt who was right and righteous and who wasn't. And the vulnerable and the marginalized would finally be lifted up that he was born to herald the one who would end all of this injustice, all of this brokenness, all of the things that he spent his whole life seeing were wrong. What would it look like to have Emmanuel, God, with us? People would definitely get what they had coming to him. All those things that John had warned about, that ax would be swinging furiously Flames licking at people's heels, and he knew them by name, whose heels uh, would be hot, hot, hot. Would this God in the flesh topple Rome as well? At very least, there should be signs that the occupation is coming to an end. John had spent his whole life imagining divine justice being played out in his lifetime. Some would pay dearly. Jesus, however, had a different way. The full revelation of God does not just look like turning the tables of punishing the chief culprits, but of a radical love that stretches near and far, that heals, that redeems, that listens, that feeds, that forgives. 
that hugs hangs on a cross advocating for the people that drove those very nails into his hands. It all leaves us scratching our head a bit, but that's the power of it. So Jesus responds to John. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. Jesus goes on to say that John is as fine as any person ever born of the flesh, ever born of a man and woman. He is as good as any, but that he pales in comparison to that heavenly vision, to the kingdom of God, to what love and justice and reconciliation and healing look like in God's dream, in God's universe. We live in a divided time. We seem predisposed to hunkering down into our respective camps, listening to our own news feeds and our own opinions that, uh, that others share with us and vilifying and shrinking the other. As we wait for God during this season, as we wait for God deeply, open your hearts. Open our hearts to be empty enough for resentment, arrogance, the things of the world to leak out so that we can receive the surprising and transforming love of God so that that kind of love, that powerful, life-changing, world-altering love can be born in us. A love that meets in an unexpected embrace in the middle of a courtroom. A love that does more than forgive, but heals and sows love that truly reconciles. Open yourself to a love desperate to be born this Christmas. Amen.